Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the meeting tonight. Thank you for your servants, workers, soul winners. We're asking, Lord, that today your word will make impact in every life in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you grant us understanding, personal application of the word to everyone in Jesus' name. Help us not to pass the word over our shoulders to other people, but to personally take uh, the word to heart so that this word will be of benefit to everyone without exception. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 43. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. In verse 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. In verse 45, it says that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. In verse 46, For if ye love them that love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. Verse 47, And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Verse 48, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Those are the familiar words we're looking at, learning from today. They're the words of Jesus Christ, and they're the words of Jesus to everyone, everyone without exception. If you look at verse 1, it tells you who the Lord Jesus was speaking to. It tells us that Jesus Christ was speaking to the multitude. In verse 1, it tells us that Jesus being said, then looked at the multitude and he spoke to the multitude. He went to them. They came to him. And in the multitudes, you have sinners, you have unbelievers, you have the Pharisees, you have the Sadducees who always presented themselves with the Lord whenever he spoke the word and his disciples too were there and seen the multitude he went up to a mountain and then around that mountain were told his disciples came unto him and then in verse 2 he opened his mouth and then began to teach them and taught them saying and so you understand the word that we have here is not only for the disciples not only for the apostles for the multitude and then he began to tell them the way of the kingdom and began to show them the word of the kingdom that if anyone among the multitude, if they were going to follow the Lord, here was the word of the Lord unto them. They will be people who are poor in spirit, 
because then there will be the kingdom of God. There will be people that mourn. They mourn for their sins. And then they'll be comforted by the grace and the comforting power of the Lord. They will be the meek, the meek who have the nature of Christ and the love of Christ and the humility of Christ. And then they will inherit the earth. The people in Spokane was telling them they must be hungry, they must be thirsty after righteousness. For then they will be filled with that righteousness. And then he tells us, he says, they will be pure in heart, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the Lord. And then he assured them when they came to the Lord, saved they came to the Lord, they were sanctified, there will be persecution. And those persecutors will be the enemies of those believers. And now he tells them, when they are persecuted, instead of being angry, instead of being uh, sorrowful, and instead of looking at their, at their scourges and all their pains, and then they'll be crying, he said, they'll be, should be full of joy. And they shall rejoice because great will be their reward in heaven. And now he comes to this part and he comes to everyone and he says, Love your enemies. Now, if a Pharisee was not able to do that, it will show him he's not yet a candidate of heaven. Love your enemies. If a backslider was not able to do that, he will know he doesn't have the grace of God. Love your enemies if a religious man is not able to do that. He will know that religion is not enough. Love your enemies if somebody who claims to be a believer, claims to be a child of God, is not able to do that. He will know that he still needs to go back to Christ and go back to Calvary and have the grace of God in his life. Love your enemies. If an apostle was not able to do that, he will know that apostleship is not enough. He must have the grace of God in him that goes beyond just being an apostle or being a preacher. It comes to you, it comes to me, it comes to everyone. Love your enemies. Let's look at that verse 44 again. It tells something in verse 44. It says, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. How do you define the enemy? The enemy is the one that cursed the believer. And he cursed that believer violently. How is the believer, the apostle, the preacher, the pastor, or the member of the church, the citizen of the kingdom, how is he to love the enemy? He is to bless the enemy that causes him. Do good to them that hate you. Who are the enemies? The people that hate the child of God. You are hated for your conviction. You are hated for your lifestyle. You are hated for any reason, whatever. Bless them and do good unto them. Are you to be a blessing to your enemies by doing good unto them? And pray for them that despitefully use you. Who are the enemies? The people that despitefully use us. They use us like slaves. They use us like uh, rags, like, uh, you know, things unwanted. And when they do that, it shows that they classify themselves as part of the enemies. And we are to pray for them, that persecute us. What shows their enemies? They're persecuting. And when they persecute us, they declare themselves and they show themselves through that persecution that they are our enemies. We love them, we bless them, we do good unto them, and we pray for them. In verse 45, it says that she may be the children of your father which is in heaven. Heaven. Those enemies show that they are not the children of God who is in heaven. They show that they are children of the devil. You are of your father, the devil. And the deeds and the works of your father, you will do. Those are the enemies. The enemies are children of the evil one. How do we show that we are actually children of God and that we are candidates of heaven and we are citizens of the kingdom? 
because we act like our heavenly father we have the nature of our father in us and then it says he maketh his son to rise from the evil who are the enemies the enemies are the evil people they're the wicked people they're the sinful people they're the transgressors they are evil and on the good who are the children of God the people who are good they are made righteous and they are made good by the grace of God and the grace of God has come to them therefore they are good he sendeth rain on the just those are the children of God those are the people who are being persecuted and on the unjust who are the enemies the enemies are the unjust they have not been justified they have not been saved they have not been converted and because of that they do things things that are unrighteous and things that are unjust and things that are ungodly and things that are unchristianly then it says in verse 46 it says for if ye love them which love you what reward of you who are the enemies the enemies are the people that love their own people they love their own tribe they love their own language people and that and no more they're the people that have limited love only to their people because you are not of their tribe and now you are not of their religion that's why they hate you that's why they are your enemies and do not even the publicans so then verse 47 for if you salute your brethren only what do ye more than others the general people those are the enemies the people that do not have the grace of God those other people do not even the publicans so then in verse 48 be ye therefore perfect even as your father as your father you have come to the kingdom your father you are born again is your father your name is written in the book of life in heaven and is your father and you belong to the family of God your father be ye therefore perfect even as your father which is in heaven is perfect tonight we're looking at Christ perpetual commandment on loving your enemies loving your enemies underline the word your your own enemies now there are many people in the world and there are some people you know there are people you don't know you cannot love the imagined enemies of mr so and so that you don't even know you cannot love the imagined enemies in theory you don't know them you don't know their enemies but you know yourself and you know the things people do and you know those who persecute you you know those who hate you and you know those who misuse you and you know those who despise you those are your enemies and the lord jesus said your own enemies you love them and it's the commandment of god is the perpetual commandment of God on loving your enemies. There are three things we're looking at quickly. Number one, practical love to our enemies. The love we're talking about is not a hidden love. It's not a theoretical love. It's not a love that, you know, is confined somewhere. I know I love everybody. They may not see, they may not know it, but I know I love everybody. That's not it. Practical tangible visible something that everybody can tell that everybody can see and then it's not only you that know that love the neighbors will know that love and it is practical demonstrable practical love for our enemies your enemies in particular number two is perverted love for his enemies perverted love for his enemies it's there we're referring to god the lord is not talking about his own enemies he can deal with them he will deal with them he's talking about your own enemies his own enemies he knows how to deal with them and there are people who have a misunderstanding on what love is 
and who we're to love and how we're to love and when and how long we're to love them but we'll talk about that when we come to his enemies what's his attitude to them and the people who hate the lord the people who hate the gospel the people who hate heaven and the people who hate even the mention of the name of the lord what's his attitude to them and what's to be your attitude to them perverted love for his enemies number three now is perfect love agape love that's the charity in first corinthians chapter 13 perfect love without enmity in your heart in your soul in your mind in your attitude in your action there's no enmity the lord has cleansed you and the lord has washed you and the lord has taken the enmity of the human nature he has taken that away from you and now because all that depravity is gone and there's the experience of sanctification there is a perfect love without any trace any iota of enmity we're coming to number one number one is practical love uh, towards uh, for our enemies for your enemies in particular we've read the passage already the lord himself said what i say unto you love your enemies do good to them that hate you and then pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you three things we're looking at number one the expression of love towards our enemies the expression of love if there is love there it must be expressed it must be expressed to that enemy that the enemy will detect and the enemy will know this is the evidence of love towards him or towards her it is the expression of love towards your enemies number two the extension of love to our enemies you don't just uh, make it uh, you know around you there you extend it like you extend the hand of fellowship that you extend you know some help helping hand you extend that love the extension of love to our enemies number three evangelization with love for our enemies we go to them we give the water of life we give the bread of life and we show them the love that will get them out of darkness and bring them to the light of the gospel evangelization with love love for our enemies number one we're looking at the expression of love towards our enemies matthew chapter 5 reading from verse 44 matthew chapter 5 verse 44 but i say unto you love your enemies bless them that curse you do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you 45 that ye may be the children of your father which is in heaven is saying when you do that people will recognize that you're a child of god they will recognize that you are the child you are a child of the heavenly father it is that action of love it is that expression of love and it is that extending your affection to them that shows people that must be a child of God. He is persecuted, he is spoken against, he is hurt, he is harassed. They even harm him, and yet no angry words and no violence and no fighting. The expression that he puts forth shows that he is a child of the heavenly father, that she may be the children of your father, which he is in heaven, for he maketh a son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain 
on the just and the unjust. It tells us in Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 14. Romans chapter 12, verse 14, bless them which persecute you. Bless them and curse not. However violent they may be, however injurious they may be, however discomforting they may be, it says you will never curse them. It says bless them and curse not. Don't say any negative word, any cursing word against them or against anyone. In verse 20 it says, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, there's a practical thing to do. If they are in need and God has blessed you with the supply of what they need, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. What that means is, number one, it could melt them to conviction, confession, and conversion. Number two, it could harden them. And they, could, they would say, no matter what you do, no matter how you care, no matter how you pray for me, no matter how you feed me in my hunger, I will still see to your downfall. Leave the results to God, but feed them and give them drink and then that will heap coals of fire either for conviction or for condemnation on them. In verse 21, it says, Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Do not be overcome of the enemy. The enemy is the evil one. The enemy is the persecutor. The enemy is the injurious one. Do not allow their evil acts, their evil action to overcome you, overcome their evil action, overcome their evil attitude, overcome their evil disposition with your good character and with the evidence that you're a real child of God. In Exodus chapter 23, we're reading from verse 4. If thou meet thine enemy's ox, or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. That's your expression of love to that enemy. Verse 5, it says, If thou see the ass of him that hateth thee, he calls him enemy in verse 4, and then in verse 5, it explains what it means to be an enemy. The one who hates you. And you find his ass lying under his body. And would this forbear to help him? You have the strength, you have the ability, and you have the skill to help him. Go ahead, thou shalt surely help him. Number two is the extension of that love to our enemies. You are extending the love to the enemy. You have water, you have food, you have some things you can do to alleviate their suffering and to ease them up. It says, extend your love to them. Extend mercy to them. Extend the agape love of God unto them. The extension of love to our enemies. For Samuel chapter 24 verse 10. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord had delivered thee today into mine hand. This is David talking to Saul in the cave. And some bade me kill thee, but mine eye spare thee. And I said, I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord. For he is the Lord's anointed. You understand all that Saul had done against David, running after him, chasing him about, and wanting to injure him. And if he had his chance, he would have killed him. And now Saul 
was sleeping and David got there and somebody said, let me strike him on your behalf just once. I'll get rich of him. And he said no. And now he went to a far place and called on Saul and said, Saul, see, you are in my hand. I could have killed you, but I extended the love and the mercy and the compassion of the Lord unto you. Verse 16. In verse 16, and it came to pass when David had made an end of speaking those words unto Saul, that Saul said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. Verse 17. It says in verse 17, And said to David, Thou art more righteous than I. That's the call of uh, fire on the head of Saul, that now he realized that David was a real child of God and was really righteous. He didn't pay him back in his own coin. And now that he had the voice of David, he said, Thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded thee evil. He confessed. He realized, I have been evil. I made myself your enemy. I've been chasing you about, harassing your life, but now you had a chance to hurt me, to harm me, even to kill me, but you did not. You have extended love unto me. This is the grace God is expecting that you will have and demonstrate that you're a real child of God and demonstrate you have the grace of God. Not that they threw a stone at you and then you pick up that stone or you get a bigger, greater, stronger stone and throw back at them. No, that to show the love unto them, extend love to your enemy. And then in verse 18, and thou hast showed this day that thou hast dealt well with me. For as much as when the Lord delivered me into thine hand, thou killed me not. Even in the Old Testament, he showed the love. He extended the love. We we'll come to Luke chapter 6, verse 35. In Luke chapter 6, verse 35, the Lord said, But love your enemies, your own enemies. Don't pretend. I love Peter's enemy. I love Mary's enemy. I love Josephine's enemy. I love my neighbor's enemy. Ah, your own enemies, the people who have hurt you and the people who are still hurting you. And the people who are doing evil or saying evil or slandering you. The people that you feel, why is he doing like that to me? Why are they acting like that to me? Love them. Love ye your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind. He was, he is, will always be kind. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Verse 36. Be ye therefore merciful, be ye therefore kind, be ye therefore loving, as your Father also is merciful, kind, and compassionate. We're coming to number three now. Is the evangelization with love for our enemies. In Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 8, but God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. We'll wait until he changes. No, the Lord did not wait. We'll wait until they're no more harmful the Lord did not wait. We'll wait until they're no more unkind, thoughtless. The Lord did not wait. 
I want to be like our Heavenly Father because God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Then in verse 9, much more then, be now justified by His blood. We shall be saved from wrath through Him. Then in verse 10, for if when we were enemies, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. We were enemies and then were reconciled unto the Lord. Much more now, being children of God, we are saved. He showed love. He showed compassion. When we were enemies, much more now that we are reconciled, we are saved by His life. Look at verse 11 there. But we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. He wants us to show that kind of love to our enemies, what he has shown to his enemies. He has shown that, that when humanity was enmity against God, he sent his only begotten son, that hateful, sinful, transgressing humanity might be saved. We take that same love because he died for everyone. He died for your family. He died for your friends. He died for your foes. He died for your enemies. Because he died for everyone, we take that good news of salvation to all our enemies. In any way we can, in every way we can, in diverse ways we can, we send forth the love of God and the love of Christ unto them. Evangelization with love for our enemies. Let's come to point number two now. And point number two is perverted love for his enemies. Perverted love for his enemies. We're looking at Second Chronicles chapter 18 and we're looking at verse 3. Second Chronicles chapter 18, verse 3, And Ahab king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat king of Judah, Wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people are as thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. Here is Ahab. Ahab hated God. Ahab brought false religion into Israel. Ahab corrupted the people of God and moved them away from serving the living God and serving the strange God of strange people. Ahab tuned the way or turned the face of the people away from God and he turned them towards Satan and towards idol worship and towards hell. He was an enemy of God. But Jehoshaphat was a real believer in God. He was over Judah, but he made the finity with Ahab. That was wrong. He perverted love. He misunderstood love. Love everybody. The thief, the robber, the injurious person, the criminal. Love everybody. Not only that Jehoshaphat loved Ahab, he also was willing to help him in his evil way. He wanted to strengthen him. He wanted to establish him in his evil way, in his idolatry, without being a kind of an instrument of conversion, of transformation, of a renewal unto him. And so when Ahab said, will you go with me to war? Come and help me. Come and support me. Come and strengthen me and bring your army and let us defeat the people who are my enemies. We don't help 
enemies of God, enemies of the gospel, enemies of godliness like that, to strengthen them to continue in their godlessness. Look at verse 7. It says in verse 7, And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him. He said, there is a true prophet. I have all these 450 prophets and more than that. I have them surrounding me. They are psychophants. And they say whatever I want them to say. And they prophesy what I like. But there's one man. He is very different. He will stand for the truth and he will stand to your face. He doesn't, he doesn't care what you do to him. There is just that one man that distinguished himself. But I hate him for he never prophesied good unto me. He tells me the soul that sinneth, it shall die. He tells me you have brought idolatry into the nation. God is angry against you. He tells me that you have sold the people of God into idolatry, into evil and into sin. And the Lord has abandoned you and is going to punish you. That's what he tells me every time. I fear him. I also hate him. He says he always tells me evil about judgment the same is Micaiah the son of Imla and Jehoshaphat said let not the king say so well eventually Micaiah came and prophesied unto him and said you are going to the battle that is going to be your last battle I want to tell you the truth this is what the Lord has revealed to me you will die in that battle Ahab said Jehoshaphat did you hear all those uh, hundreds of prophets, they spoke well. Do you hear what he's saying? And then he says, okay, um, you know, put him in the prison until I come again. And then Makar said, if you come back again, the Lord has not sent me. He said, hear everybody. And now he told Jehoshaphat, look at verse 29. In verse 29, and the king of Israel, that's Ahab said unto Jehoshaphat, that's the king of Judah, I will disguise myself and will go to the battle. But put thou on thy robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and they went to the battle in Bastachi. In Bastachi, now the king of Syria, which he war against Ahab, commanded the captains of the chariots that were with him, saying, Fight ye not with small or great, save except only Ahab with the king of Israel, Ahab. Verse 31, it says in verse 31, when those people that were fighting against the king and were looking for the king, you know, meanwhile, Ahab had disguised himself. And uh, so they thought the Jehoshaphat, who dressed like a king, they thought he was actually the king. And then in verse 31, and it came to pass when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat that they said, it is the king of of Israel. Therefore, they compassed him to fight against him. But Jehoshaphat cried out to the Lord, help me. And the Lord helped him. And God moved them to depart from him. Now, in chapter 19, verse 2. Chapter 19, we're looking at verse 2. It says, And now Jehu, the prophet, came. It said, Jehu, the son of Ananiah, the seer, went out to meet him and said to the king Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Should you help the ungodly? establish the ungodly should you strengthen the ungodly in his evil deed in his evil act and his enmity against the almighty god is that right for you shouldn't you make a distinction between your own personal enemy and the enemy of the almighty god you've done wrong you have perverted the love of God. Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them 
that hate the Lord therefore because of that perverted love I love everybody I don't worship her and I can give him money to strengthen him in his idol worship and the nightclub people I can help them give them money to help them buy all the drinks they want to buy I can support the one, the polygamist that is marrying the second wife, and then I can go there to grace the occasion. I can help them, even the thieves who have stolen from everybody, government and everyone, they've stolen from the nation. I can also add my support for them when they're celebrating. Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore, is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. We're looking at three things here. Number one, proper perception of God's enemies. Yes, there are people who are the enemies of God. And we need to have the proper perception of those who are the enemies of God. Number two, pernicious preoccupation of gospel's enemies, of the enemies of the gospel. There are number one, the enemies of God. Number two, the enemies of the gospel. Number three, perpetual punishment for God forsaking enemies. When the enemies of God are adamant and they say, let his blood be upon us and on our children and they resist the gospel and they fight the gospel and they want to prevent the preaching of the gospel to those who need to hear. They are perpetual enemies of God and they are forsaken by God and there is the perpetual punishment for such God forsaking enemies let's look at number one here proper perception of god's enemies we're looking at psalm 37 and we're looking at verse 20 psalm 37 we're reading from verse 20 it says the wicked shall perish and the enemies of the lord enemies of the lord enemies of the lord shall be at the fat of lambs they shall consume into smoke and they shall consume away. There are the enemies of the Lord. Acts of the Apostles chapter 13. We're reading from verse 8. Acts chapter 13 verse 8. But Elimas the sorcerer, for so is his name, by interpretation was to them, that's Paul and Barnabas, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Paul and Barnabas were preaching the gospel unto that deputy. But this Elimas, he was an enemy of the gospel, an enemy of the word, an enemy of the grace of God, an enemy of Christ who died for all at Calvary, an enemy of the deputy. He wanted to block the deputy from hearing the gospel. And then we're told in verse 9, in verse 9 we're told, then Saul who also is called Paul filled with the Holy Holy Ghost set his eyes on him. Look at verse 10 now. In verse 10, is and said, O fool of all subtlety and all mischief. Look at this. Thou child of the devil. Listen to this. Thou enemy of all righteousness. He hated the word of righteousness. He hated the gospel of grace. He hated the message coming from heaven and coming to the deputy. He was the enemy of all righteousness. The way of righteousness was the enemy to that. The word of righteousness, it was an enemy to that. And the way that will bring us, the path that will bring us the gospel, that will bring us into the righteousness of God and get us saved, it was an enemy to that. Thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Now, Saul, what are you trying to do? What are you going to do? Do you remember the Lord said, love your enemies? And Paul replies, it's not my enemy. 
He doesn't know me. He doesn't hate me for anything. What he hates is the gospel. What he hates is the word. What he hates is the righteousness. What he hates is the way of truth. He is not my enemy. He is the enemy of the gospel. Now look at the next verse in verse 11. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee. And thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for his season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and in darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by there. And look at the result of that in verse 12. And then the deputy, when he saw what was done, that the enemy of God, the enemy of the gospel was conquered. When he saw what was done, he believed being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. It's First Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 15. First Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 15. The enemies of God, the enemies of the gospel, and the enemies of the grace of God. First Thessalonians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 15. Who both killed the Lord, the Lord Jesus, and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. Then in verse 16, it says, Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. The, the enemies of the way, the will, the wisdom of God. Welcome to number two here. And this is pernicious preoccupation of the gospel's enemy. The enemy of the gospel. The enemies of the gospel. Look at their preoccupation. Matthew chapter 13. Reading from verse 25. In Matthew chapter 13 verse 25. And while men slept, his enemy came and so tires among the wheat and went their way. The master, the Lord, the Savior, had sown the good seed of the gospel. But he has an enemy, not your enemy, not my enemy, the enemy of Christ, the enemy of the gospel, the enemy of the sacrifice of Christ, the enemy of the way of salvation. The Lord, the Master, had planted the good seed. And now, when men slept, the enemy came and sowed tears among the wheat and went its way. Then in verse 26, But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tears also. In verse 27, it says so. The servants of the household came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then came eight tares? Look at verse 28. He said unto them, An enemy has done this. He planted good doctrine. Where did false doctrine come? To confuse the people, an enemy has done this. He gave the pure gospel, the gospel that brought salvation to people. And then some people brought false doctrine that will confuse them. And they will say, without circumcision, you cannot be saved. How did this come? An enemy has done this. He brought the way of conversion and the gospel truth unto the people. And then confusion came. How are we going to be saved? Is there heaven? Is there hell? Can we do anything we like to do and still get to heaven? Where has this come from? An enemy has done this. We're looking at Galatians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 6. In Galatians chapter 1, reading from verse 6, I marvel that he has so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. 
In verse 7, it says, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Those are the enemies of the gospel. They're not your enemies per se. They're not after you. They're after the gospel. They want to steal away the pure gospel, the pure word from the hearts of the people. An enemy is doing that, perverting the gospel of Christ. Verse 8, then verse 8 says, but do we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have preached unto you. Let him be a curse. Ah, Paul, don't you remember the words of Jesus? Love your enemies. They are not my enemies. They are the enemies of the gospel. They are the enemies of the grace of God. They are the enemies of the almighty God. The Lord God in heaven has sent his only begotten son and then he has sacrificed the son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. They are blocking that gospel. They are perverting that gospel. They are changing that gospel. They are falsifying that gospel. And because they are falsifying the gospel of Christ, that's why they are not my enemy, they are enemy of God. They are the enemies of the gospel. Paul, let them be a cause, whether they're angels or they're men. And then in verse 9, it says, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man of whatever stature, if any man of whatever position, if any man of whatever title, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be be a curse in second uh, corinthians chapter 11 second corinthians chapter 11 reading from verse 2 for i am jealous over you with godly jealousy for i have espoused you to one husband that i may present you as a chaste virgin to christ and now in verse 13, in verse 13, it says, For such are false apostles, after he had preached the gospel unto the people, that will get them saved, that will get them sanctified, that will get them established, the children of God in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. Then another person or some other people, they come in and they're presenting a false gospel that says there's no holiness, nobody can be holy will all continue in sin forever and ever and uh, you know even if we backslide if we could do anything wrong grace is still there we'll still go to heaven it says such are false apostles deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ and then it says in verse 14 it said and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light then in verse 15 it tells us, therefore, it is no great sin if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Look at number three, is the perpetual punishment for God forsaking enemies, the people who are forsaking the Lord, and the Lord are forsaking them. It says in Second Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 15, which are forsaking the right way, the righteous way, the godly way. They're forsaking the gospel way. They're forsaking the narrow path and the narrow way that leads to heaven. They're forsaking the way of truth and the way of the gospel and the way of holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. They are forsaking the right way and they have gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozo, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. And then in verse 16, were told uh, but was rebuked for his iniquity the dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet verse 17 then says these are wells without water clouds that are carried with a tempest 
for whom to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. The mist of darkness is reserved forever. Let's come to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 13. In Luke chapter 19, verse 13, and he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Keep on preaching the gospel till I come. Keep on running after those sinners and compel them to come in into the kingdom. Keep on doing the work. Be occupied in the evangelization until I come. Verse 14 says, But his citizens hated him, hating Christ. Those are the enemies of Christ. Enemies of the King of Kings, enemies of the Lord of Lords, enemies of the Savior. His citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. We'll not surrender to him, we'll not yield to him, we'll not accept his salvation will not accept what he has brought and what is given us from the cross of Calvary. Verse 27, it says, But those mine enemies who don't want me to reign over them, who do not want to accept my kingship, my lordship, my authority, my sovereignty, and those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them. Bring them hither and slay them before me. Perpetual punishment for God forsaking enemies. We're coming to point number three now. Perfect love without enmity. We're coming to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 45. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, that he may be the children of your father, merciful father, that he may be merciful, compassionate father, that he too may be compassionate, loving father, that he too may be loving, caring father, that he too may be caring, considerate father, that he too may be considerate. Heavenly Father, that you too may be heavenly minded, that she may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. Verse 48. In verse 48, be ye therefore perfect even as your father which is in heaven is perfect father in heaven heavenly father is perfect and we are to be as perfect as he is what he loves we love who he loves we love what he hates we hate what he stands for we stand for his character his attributes, his holiness, what delights him is what delights us. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Three things we're looking at the arrival love for the heavenly Father, the unequaled love for the heavenly Father, the unlimited love. For the heavenly father the way he loves he wants us to reciprocate his love to love him as well unrivaled love unending love unequaled love unparalleled love unquantifiable love for the heavenly father the unrivaled love for the heavenly father number two is the unceasing unending love for the homely family your own family 
in your own home, husband, wife, wife, husband, and the uninterrupted love, the love that goes on and on, that's the kind of love the Lord is expecting. Not only for your enemies, how about your family? How about the people that are at home with you? You have that unceasing, uninterrupted love for the homely family. And now number three is the unwavering love, unshakable love, unchanging love for human friends and foes. Unchanging, unwavering, unstoppable, continuing love for the human friends and foes. Number one is the unrivaled, unparalleled, unequaled love for the heavenly father. Matthew chapter 22, reading from verse 37, and Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. You are born again, is thy God. You are converted, is thy God. Your name is written in the book of life in heaven, is thy God. You will love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Verse 38, this is the first and great command. What's the meaning of that? This is the priority. This is the premier love. This is the first. This is the greatest. And this is the number one love. The love of your family is only after this. And the love of your friends is only after this. And the love of the enemies is only after this. You cannot love family, friend, foe, enemy in a way that will contradict your love for God. Your love for God is number one. It is unrivaled. It is unparalleled. It's unequal. And it is number one. And it is irreplaceable. You cannot say, okay, I'm loving my enemy. I won't come to church because I'm trying to love my enemy. I won't read the Bible. I'm trying to love my enemy. I won't be righteous. I'm trying to love my enemy. I will compromise. I'm trying to love my enemy. The love of God comes as number one. And it's only after that is secured. After that is, is established that you can love any other person here on earth. This is the force and the great commandment that you love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. In Matthew chapter 10, reading from verse 37. Matthew chapter 10, reading from verse 37, it says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The love of God is number one. The love of God is a priority. Any other love that will contradict, that will stop, that will rival, the love of God is unacceptable to the Lord. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter wife or husband more than me is not worthy of me he that loves a man a woman a friend a, you know a relative more than me is not worthy of me and then in verse 38 it tells us and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me in uh, first john chapter 4 reading from verse 17 First John chapter 4, reading from verse 17, here is a love made perfect. Here is a love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. If you have loved the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with everything that is within you. You love his word, and you love his way, and you love his total will complete without uh, taking anything away from the word of the will of God. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this present world. As he Christ is, 
as he will love the father and as he loved the father when he was here and if he were here today he will love the father the heavenly father with all his that all his soul and all his mind and the love of the father the love of god will be number one in his heart as he is so are we in this world and then in verse 18 it says and there is no fear in love the lord jesus loved the heavenly father and he spoke to him every time there's no fear in his heart he loved without fear and he loved his disciples too without fear anything he ought to tell them he told them he wasn't afraid of them they'll misunderstand this even judas Iscariot was there he was he had no fear there is no fear in love even when the pharisees and sadducees were there he had no fear he touched the watch of God without fear, without favor, because his heart was full of love. And that love sent him to Calvary, and there was no fear on that cross. The love of God was still there. I'm doing this for the love of my heavenly father. I'm doing this for the love of humanity. There is no fear in love. He said, because fear has torment. Fear has torment. When you are afraid of anyone, you are tormenting yourself. They might even be innocent. They might not mean anything bad. You might be the one interpreting what they are doing to mean that they are doing evil. And your interpretation is what is bringing the fear in your heart. But if you were to bring God between you and them, and you don't see them, you see God. And you see that they cannot go beyond whatever God has ordained for you. Whatever you're ordained, all things work together for good. For them that love God, those who are called according to his purpose. If you're always looking at God and looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, and you love God and you love Christ and you love his word and you love the gospel and you love everything he has provided in, at Calvary, then all those other people, there's no fear for them because you know you are totally at the center of the will of God. But if you are going about, you are tormented, you can't think straight, you can't act straight, you can't talk straight because you are afraid of this you're afraid of that and their fear will tie rope on your feet on your legs and then they're pulling you here and there because of fear and you're living by fear your love is not perfect come back and say lord now i give myself totally completely unreservedly without any rival i give myself unto you and the love of god will preserve you and there will be no fear of torment in your life in jesus name he that feareth is not made perfect in love you know, there are parents that fear their children and they cannot tell them the truth. They cannot preach the gospel to them. They cannot correct them. They cannot show them the right way. This is the right way. There are pastors, there are preachers that uh, fear their members. They cannot tell them the truth and show them the way of salvation because they are afraid. They are afraid of men. They are afraid of women. They are afraid of children. They are afraid of everybody. They are afraid of powerless people. They are afraid of graceless people. They are afraid of godless people. They are so much afraid of people who do not mean who cannot do any evil even if they tried and they're not afraid of god they are not loving god but when your life is made perfect and then you surrender totally to the lord you will not fear anything i will not fear anything i will not fear anyone ah you're afraid of goliath you're afraid of herod you are afraid of Nicodemus. You are afraid of people who are going about and say, I will do this, I will do this. They cannot do anything beyond what God has ordained. There is no fear in love. Perfect love. What kind of love? Tell me out aloud. Perfect love casteth out fear because fear has torment. He that feareth always fearing he that feareth always fearing 
The fear they cannot carry out their conviction. The fear they cannot obey God. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. In verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. Number two here, number two is the unceasing love for the human family. Love in the family, husband and wife, unceasing love, uninterrupted love, a love that will not allow them to separate, a love that will not allow them to divorce, a love that says the Lord has put them together, and whether it is, uh, you know, in riches or in constraint or in difficulties or challenges until death do us part. And it is not love that we just manage and tolerate when dear. It is love we enjoy. It is love coming out of the heart from the husband to the wife, from the wife to the husband, from the parents to the children, from the children to the parents. And if there is anything that had um, interrupted that love or caused any kind of hurt, you come together, you face one another. You know, there are wives, they always look down, they cannot look at the face of their husband, fear. There are husbands that look down, they cannot look at the face of their wives. And so the wives, uh, you know, they know that she or the man is afraid of me and always looking down so I can hurt him is afraid of me look up eyeball to eyeball your husband and wife whatever will happen settle that thing and let there be unceasing uninterruptible love in the family we're looking at Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 it says husbands love your wives Husbands, love your wives. There are different things that will happen, but remember this, the commandment of the Lord, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for each. Look at Titus chapter 2. In Titus chapter 2, we're reading from verse 3. It says, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Not false accusers, not giving too much wine, teachers of good things. In verse 4, it says that they may teach the young women to be sober. Teach the young women. Young women, you bring them to salvation. You bring them to the knowledge of the Lord that brings transformation. If any man, if any woman be in Christ, it's a new creature. All things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. And that new life, that's what we are to teach the young women. And you teach them to be sober and to love their husbands and to love their husbands and love their children. Husbands are to love their wives and the wives are to love their husbands. And the love again is practical in First John chapter 3 verse 16. First John chapter 3 verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. If the brethren are to do that, how much more the wife to the husband, how much more the husband to the wife it's not just, you know, we're together, we're together, we're not separated, we're not divorced. That's good. That's the first step about the love, the love that gives yourself, the love that abandons yourself. But remember, the love of God first, the love of your creator first, the love of the almighty force, the love of the one that gave his only begotten son that will not perish, that love force, and then after that, in the family, for your husband, for your wife, the love that gives anything without hiding what you have, without hiding your property, the love that makes you to go out and sweat and earn a living and bring back to the family. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Verse 17, it says in verse 17, 
17, for whoso has this world's good and sees his brother, her husband, or his wife have need and shutteth up the bowels of compassion from him, from her, how dwelleth the love of God in him. Verse 18, it says, My little children, let us not love in word, that is in word only, neither in tongue, in tongue only, but in deed and in truth. I pray that this kind of love that provides, that cares, that supports, that protects, that stays together, that helps, that encourages, that influences positively, will remain in our families in Jesus' name. Did I hear a good amen? amen. Number three now is the unwavering love for human friends and foes. The unwavering love for friends and foes. In Romans chapter 12, verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. Let love be without deception. Let love be without hypocrisy. Let love be without superficiality. Let it be real. Let it be transparent. Let it be beneficial. Let it be profitable. And let it go from the heart to the heart of the other person. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. And then in verse 10, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. And then he tells us in verse 11, be not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Verse 13, distributing to the necessity of the saints, giving to hospitality. Verse 14, bless them which persecute you. Enemies, bless them which persecute you. They slander you. They try to hurt you. They try to harm you. They have to put, you know, some yoke on you. They try to imprison you. They try to hinder you. Bless them. That's persecution for the godly. Bless and curse not. In verse 15, it says, Rejoice with them, that do rejoice, whether they are friends or enemies, rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. In verse 16, be of the same mind one to another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Verse 17, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Do you observe that? Or do you say, ah, you know to hurt? I know that you. I'm also a human being. You are more than a human being. You're a believer. You're a child of God. You're a pilgrim going on your way to heaven. And you know the Lord can come anytime. Don't copy them. Don't act like them. Recompense to no man. Recompense to no woman. Evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Verse 18. If it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Somebody wants to start a fight, don't encourage that. Live peaceably with all men. Somebody wants to put a stumbling block in front of you and then you jump over it and then adjust it. When it's coming, a stumbling block will be a stumbling stone. Don't do that. If it be possible, as much as lies in you, live 
peaceably with all men. Someone is starting a shout and is starting a fight, is starting a quarrel. And you remember, you're a man of peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Don't have their shouting match of them. Don't have their argument with them. Don't get into conflict with them. Be a real Christian every time, loving God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and loving your neighbor, loving your friends, even loving your enemies the way Christ has taught us to love. If it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Verse 19, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Dearly beloved, saved children of God, avenge not yourselves. Sanctified, made holy and righteous, avenge not yourselves. Whatever the provocation, whatever is coming from the other side, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. How are we to act? How are you to act? How am I to act? Verse 20. It says, therefore, because of all this, the love of God the love of your fellow believers, the love of members in the family, the love of everyone. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt keep coals of fire on his head. And in verse 21, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And the grace of God to do all that God is teaching us today, all that we're reminded of today, that grace be abundant and sufficient, overflowing in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise up now and take everything we've learned to the Lord in prayer. Love, practical love, love, purposeful love, love. Agape love, Calvary love. Love, the love of Christ in the saved soul. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. What has been your attitude to your enemies? Those who persecute you? Those who speak against you? Those who slander you, those who cast out your name as evil, those who are not sincere with you, those who are deceptive, those who want your hurt, what has been your attitude towards them? Those who go out, to destroy you, destroy your character, destroy your personality? What has been your attitude towards them? Those who curse, those who insult, those who belittle, those who look down on you, those who steal your self-confidence, those who oppress, what has been your attitude towards them? If you hate them, you become like them. If you fight them, you become as weak as them. Slanderers are weak in character. Those who hurt other people are mindless, they're weak in character. If you are mindless like them to revenge, to throw their stones back to them, you become as weak as they are. If you cry, then they know you are really, really weak. They'll do more, and then they push you to the wall, you'll fight back. 
and you will not be acting in grace. It's only those who are strong who can love those who hate them. Be strong in the grace of God. Only those who are strong can bless. Those who curse can do good to those who persecute them. That takes strength of character. It's only those who are strong in character that can have pity on those who rejoice at their hurt. How strong are you? How weak are you? Tell the Lord, grant me your grace and help me to love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my mind. As the Lord, rainy season, dry season, love the Lord. Time of challenges and time of upliftment, love the Lord. Time of persecution, when enemies are running at you, and times of peace, when friends are supporting you, love the Lord. Times of confusion, times at a crossroad. I can't understand this. I can't understand that. Love the Lord. Don't ever stop loving the Lord. When it's a great challenge to love the Lord, love him all the same. When the difficulties are there, prayers yet to be answered, let not the love of God stop in your life. That the first and the great commandment, thou shalt love the Lord. Love him above your comfort. Love him above material things. Love him above family members. Love him above everything on earth. Let there be no rival to the love of God. Love him. And express that love in worship. Express that love in working for him. Express that love in obeying Him. Express that love in serving Him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Love Him. Perfect love casts out fear. The fear of that person can injure me. Wait for him. That woman can hurt me. Wait for her. Don't look at him. Don't look at her as an injurious person. Look at him. Look at her in the love of God. Fearing nothing. Because perfect love casts out fear. Don't fear anyone less than the Creator. Don't fear anyone less than your Redeemer. Perfect love of God in your heart will cast out 
every fear. About your wife, maybe she has some things you don't, you don't appreciate. Don't look at that. Look at the commandment of God: love her. About your husband, he does some things you don't appreciate. Don't slander him. Don't go about gossiping about him. Don't hurt him because you feel hurt yourself by him. Love him. Let there be love, Christ like love in the family. Don't make your love superficial, theoretical. Make it practical, purposeful, evident, visible, tangible. And love the work of God. Conversion of souls salvation of souls it pains you that people are missing out on salvation do your best utmost best to reach out and extend the hand of love to give the word of salvation, the water of life, the bread of life to those who are perishing. Commit yourself to that. Day and night, Always, every time. Let love influence everything you do. Be thoughtful. Be caring. Commit yourself to this, promise the Lord, ask Him for grace, the grace to love like He wants you to love, the grace to have a positive attitude to everyone in every situation, and be a real new, renewed creature of God. His grace is sufficient for you. His grace will not fail if you ask him in Jesus name we pray yeah. Heavenly Father we thank you for what we have learned today we are asking Lord in your mercy in your love your grant every one of us sufficient abundant appropriate grace to love like you want each of us to love in Jesus name Amen. plant your love in our hearts Amen. help us Lord in every circumstance at every crossroad whatever the challenge 
to love you, our God, our Father, our Redeemer, our Savior, our Lord, to love you with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, in Jesus' name. Help us to love fellow believers as Christ has loved us. Humanly, it's impossible to love like Christ, but graciously, all things are possible. We believe you plant such love, a gappy love, God kind of love, in every one of our hearts, in Jesus' name. Help us to balance that love with the knowledge and revelation of Scripture. Not to love to age and abet and to compromise or sin or or sinners, to love them enough to say no to when to them when they demand things that are contrary to your will, that courage, that power, that strength to say no when we are called to compromise. Give us that grace in Jesus' name. And yet, help us to have appropriate love. The love that will share the gospel, give the gospel, give the water of life and give the bread of life. The love that will not fear any human being, but will approach them with your love and show them the way of life in Jesus' name. Grant us the love that casts out fear, that will not fear man, woman, child, anyone, but just to love. Inside us, in our mind, in our heart, in our soul, in our spirit, in our thinking, in our attitude, even the expression of outward life. Let there be love in Jesus' name. The love that gives. The love that is at peace. The love that helps other people. The love that lifts up the fallen. The love that gives bread to the hungry. The love that gives water to the thirsty. And the love that makes us free in Christ to live a life glorifying, honoring to you and helpful to all our neighbors. Establish every one of us in your love in Jesus' name. And we pray that the power and the provision of love will work in every life. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah.